Hello and welcome back. This is the 10th video in the series. And in this video, we're going to look at the flow friction analysis. And this one is simple, but it's very powerful, especially when you're dealing with individuals or teams, products, programs, processes, line management, or even portfolio managers, directors, executives, the whole organization. This is one of your key tools to help people deal with the mindset of where they're at and where you'd like them to be. Okay, So moving people is all about understanding how to do this. We're going to get back to that picture in just a couple of minutes, but we're going to look at the friction analysis. And again, it's part of the flow formula where you have vision plus right people plus 4D, uh, which is defined as still deliver and drive and equals flow and success. And now we're going to apply these into the four lenses. So individual team, product program, process, line management, portfolio, executive, and the whole organization. I love this quote from Peter Drucker. Only three things happen naturally in organizations. Friction, confusion, and underperformance. Everything else requires leadership. And that's the whole idea behind flow is it's not enough to just be good managers. You need to understand leadership, the language of leadership, and how to be good leaders regardless of where you're at in the organization for the organization to step into flow you need really good leaders and leadership so here's the flow friction analysis and <clears throat> i'm not going to go into the depths of the of the formula again we just did that in the last video so I'm going to focus on this part of the um, friction analysis where line by line we're going to go through this. If you don't have the right vision, you probably got anarchy going on in your teams and organization. If you don't have the right people on the team, I can guarantee you, you're going to have some anxious team members who are staying awake at night going, oh boy, uh, you know, this person or that person, they're not the right person for our team and it's going to make our lives miserable. If you don't have the right definitions, you'll definitely have confusion. And if you see politics rearing its ugly head in the organization, I will guarantee you that they have not distilled agreement among the stakeholders about the definitions. Okay, And so if you've got politics, then that's going to really hinder and impede your ability to deliver. If you don't have the ability to deliver, you're going to have chaos. And if you don't have the ability to drive, you really risk splitting into division or into multiple visions because the vision in English literally means two visions. So let's go back to the anarchy statement. Do you remember the proverb I shared with you that where there's no vision, the people cast off restraint? That's basically anarchy as a definition. And we see that happening in the world right now where you have two very, uh, two opposing worldview views and visions about how the world should look. And because of that, they're, they're not coming together to try to create a unity. They're pulling apart. And we're seeing a lot of anarchy in the streets, literally, where people are... Uh, burning down buildings and looting and just going nuts, basically. 
And I don't think that's the vision that anybody has for the world in which we want to live. Uh, not from either side. And so we need to have a much more clear vision on what does the world look like that we want to live in. Now, we mentioned uh, this idea about anxiety. If you have team members and they're anxious and they're really concerned and they're fretting a lot, you need to start asking questions and find out what's really going on. Uh, I had a team where you could just see that uh, when everybody else on the team heard that that person was going to be on the team, they were all just like, oh, and you could just see all the motivation. It just went, and you just knew that, oh boy, this is going to be a, uh, an issue. And at first it wasn't a problem because the team members were covering for each other. And one of the other team members was covering for this person really well. But then this one person, they got pulled off into another project. And this person just bubbled to the top as an issue. And in the end, they, they decided to take themselves out off the team by literally leaving the company. I guess that this had happened multiple times. And this was pretty much this person's last chance to try to make it as a team member in that organization. But the anxiety level and the discouragement level it created on the other team members, it was, you could just see the actual impact that that had. And later, as they were going through the iterations and sprints, eventually it, it became very clear that that one person, it was like the old golf, golfing joke where uh, somebody said, hey, you know, uh, this guy comes into the clubhouse and he's just sweating and he's out of breath. And they said, hey, what happened? He goes, yeah, well, me and Joe, we were out on, on uh, doing our 18 round uh, hole round of golf. And on the ninth hole, Joe died. And they said, oh, that's terrible. What happened then? He said, well, after that was hit the ball and drag Joe, hit the ball and drag Joe. And so he had to drag him with for the next nine holes. And for a team that's not working, it can feel exactly like that. It's almost like weekend at Bernie's or something like that. And so that's just going to create an incredible level of anxiety. So if you're the leader and you're trying to get a product through the system and uh, the concept create and deploy, going through all those phases to get it out to the customer, and you're seeing anarchy, that's not a nice environment to be in. Uh, we'll get to another example of just how hard that was for a company when we get down to the deliver part down there at chaos. But if you've got team members who are anxious or you detect that anxiety, you can start to ask questions and you can start to do root cause analysis, use 5Y, use the 4R model in reverse, use the 4D model in reverse. Those are really good root cause analysis tools to help you identify quickly what is the source of this anxiety? It's going to be pretty evident, but in case it's hidden, like it was with that one team, and then that person got pulled away, and the other person bubbled up as the issue, then, you know, you just have to be constantly on your guard and watching for things like that. What's really interesting is in every project, <laughs> without fail, as you're going through the four Ds, as you're doing definitions, distill, deliver, and drive, and coming back. As you come around the curve there, there's without exception, as you're delivering, I, I haven't had a project or a product development uh, effort in the last 25 years where somebody hasn't come in and said, oh, cool, this is what you guys are doing, oh, what's this all about? Oh, um, did you think about this? Or they say, Or they'll say, Oh, by the way, <laughs> anytime you hear that, that's a little red flag to tell you that, oh boy, we're going to get some new definitions. So because of that, you need to be constantly listening 
for any kind of definition where it's creating confusion or any new definition that's literally forces you to go through the iterative process for the leadership part because now you have a new project or you potentially a new project. I had a CEO come to me and say, hey, Andrew, we need to make this one small change. And I said, Mr. CEO, that's really interesting. What's this change about? Asked a bunch of questions. I said, hmm, let me take that to the team and let's see what that's going to cost. So we went back to the team. We said, this is what this Mr. CEO would like to have. And we said, oh, 1.2 million euros on a $400,000 project. <laughs> went back to Mr. CEO and said, that's a great idea. It's going to cost you this much. He looked at me and he went, keep going with what you're doing. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you're going to get these kinds of things thrown at you continually by the stakeholders. And they're not doing it to be mean. They're just, they're just like, oh, that's a great idea. Let's see if we can do that. But then when they find out the cost benefit and what the economic trade-off is, because I, to I told the CEO, I said, look, if you do that, and we do this one, it's going to cost you three times as much, plus you don't get what we were working on. And he went, oh, well, no, we need what you're working on. We need that first. It's like, okay, then we'll continue to go. And so anytime you detect confusion, if somebody says, well, you know, I really don't understand this item <coughs> in the backlog, man, you better be looking at that really quickly and going, ooh, that's going to be a friction point. And you need to be able to step up and intervene with the team and use it as a coaching moment and a teaching moment and a mentoring moment for that team to help bring them up the curve. The politics one, <clears throat> if you don't distill agreement and you don't have agreement, it's going to be uh, a massacre. We're going to see that in, an, in another uh, picture that comes, for, again, from a real live uh, effort that we were doing a rollout. And it just so elegantly po uh, paints the picture of if you don't have that agreement, uh, this is the mistake that a lot of executives make over and over again. They inform and then they expect the team to act. And there's a whole lot of steps in, in between that have to happen before that action's going to occur. And so if you inform and you expect action and then nothing is happening, then that's when the executives start getting heartburn. Well, that's because they missed a whole bunch of steps in between, and we'll talk about that using the 4D model again on how to fix that. One of the worst things I've ever seen on delivery was a company I worked with uh, many years ago. <clears throat> and the CEO's idea of getting the new release out the door, and this was a big platform, was to lock 80 developers in a room for the weekend from Friday night to Monday morning, literally lock them in and have everybody yelling at each other trying to get the next release completed as they're going to take it to market. And at the end of the two and a half, three days over that weekend from Friday night to Monday morning, they would release something. And then they would spend the next three months fixing all the bugs that they just created from that release. <laughs> and so uh, chaos as a methodology for uh, doing delivery, that's just going to burn your people out. And if you see chaotic deliveries, then you already know that you're probably dealing with everything else above you on the list. The last one, if you're not doing retrospectives and continuously improving, uh, you have a really high risk of having diverging visions and creating division, even within your team and among individuals. So you as the leader, you need to be continually listening. We use this, by the way, 
as a way to uh, look at a project when we arrive we're looking for all of these things right up front are we seeing anarchy anxiety confusion politics chaos division and we actually have a little list with checkbox and we check off the ones that are there because we know immediately we got to work on those right from the start if we ever have any hope of getting this team into flow okay and so it's a lot of work to eliminate these and you have to be at the top of your game at all times in order to be able to do this. And you got to be able to do it in all four lenses. And we talk about this in transformation. But we use this at the individual level. If somebody's confused, you better talk to them. We do it at the team level. If they're not able to deliver, we use this analysis. We look at it from the product level. Do they actually have the real definitions from the customer? Is the customer embedded with the product owner? Is the product owner actually the voice of the customer or are they just a proxy? And so if we see things like that, we know we have to fix it. And then the vision part coming from the organization, you have vision in all four boxes. But if this one's messed up, I'll guarantee you that the other three boxes are messed up because you can't touch one box without impacting the other three. And that's just how it works. And so if you want to have any hope of having a unified vision throughout the organization, you better use the flow friction analysis and all the other tools that we provide you about vision in order to make sure that you are able to quickly detect these. Now, Agilists aren't taught this analysis tool and they're not taught the difference between the two right-hand boxes and the two left-hand boxes. And Agilists love working with the teams and individuals, but they hate the politics that pops up routinely over here on the right-hand side. And, you know, a lot of people look at politics and just say, well, it's a blood sport. I'm not interested in politics. And and that's a defense and coping mechanism. So if you see people who are not politically astute uh, trying to get things done without being able to mitigate the politics or eliminate the politics using the tools that we provide, it's going to be really painful. So we went through vision, right people, the 4D model. Uh, how to apply these to the four lenses. Uh, we've talked about the four whys uh, previously, <clears throat> especially in the uh, uh, product box. And you can use uh, the friction analysis with the four whys as well. You know, is our vision to make money, reduce costs, get rid of or mitigate risk or do the right thing. And so by applying those to the four lenses as well, you have a better chance of eliminating the, fr the friction that you're going to be up against. So the thing you need to do in order to use the flow friction analysis is figure out how to live and breathe it and how to apply it to traditional waterfall efforts that you might be doing lean theories of constraint types of processes or work efforts that you're doing and then especially to agile and scrum because this tool if you only use this one and nothing else you're going to get multiple increases in what you're delivering over what you were doing before so again you got to take it out of the book out of the videos out of the blog posts and actually start to use it and we actually have uh, in the Flow Coach, uh, the Flow Certified Coach series, you're going to hear from some of the coaches how they apply this. And you're just going to go, oh, okay, I really get this now. Uh, it's great to hear about it from me, but it's even more powerful to hear about it from the voices of Flow, from other Flow practitioners who are actually doing this. <laughs>